Brody from New York University. The title of her talk is Earth System Ethics, a proposal for a systems approach to ethics. Great. Well, thank you very much. What a prompt start. Now, I have to make sure I keep it in time. It's really nice to be here. Sorry if I have my back to you a little bit. Um, it's actually wonderful to be here. This is um, some research I've, I've really just started working on. It's in its infancy, so I'm really looking forward to getting some feedback from all of you. Um, and it's just really great to be in the company of such intelligent and slightly intimidating people. Um, um, also, with some really great hair stars. Um, I think some great ideas of when I go back to Brooklyn. Um, so, I'm going to launch straight in because I would like to um, you know, have as much time for discussion as possible. Um, so, uh, as the title says, I'm, um, I'm proposing a, a, system for a, a systems approach to ethics. Um, and the reason why I think this is so important is, um, you know, given um, everything that we know now about Earth system science, um, but how that's not necessarily translating to um, the public at large um, and public policy community as well. Um, and so, if I just start here with a little quote that has been rolling around in my mind for the last little while from someone I'm reading a lot of at the moment, Urban Laszlo. He's a systems philosopher and uh, systems thinker. Um, the world has been systematically broken up and studied for centuries. Now more than ever before, it's time the time has come to piece it back together. So we have a coherent whole again. And only then we have achieved what is commonly referred to as modernity. So the proposal um, that I'm putting forward is um, a systematic study um, of the, the moral dimensions, including you know, moral uh, vision, decisions and conduct, um, policies, um, of, of the study of Earth system science. Um, and this is an estab establishment of an analytical framework um, that is has a distinct um, ethical approach that's different from environmental ethics, it's um, different from bioethics, um, and it's distinctive from, uh, from uh, philosophy of own. Um, in that it's providing the basis of a normative framework to think, respond, act. Um, and bioethics is a useful precedent. I draw on that um, to help um, set up you know, by, um, as an architecture, the pr principles approach can be uh, very useful, and bioethics is a, is a uh, field that um, has, has really um, done really well over the last sort of 30, 40 years, um, and it's based on, uh, on biomedical principalism. Um, and so that, that's overall the, the architecture of the, um, the discipline that I'm, I'm proposing. Um, and so, I mean, ultimately, on, on the, the, the bigger picture, the reason why, um, you know, this is an important time, I, I think, for um, advancing this, this sort of wider discussion is um, really, on the one hand, to help scientists to um, really bridge the, the knowledge gap from where they are and, um, you know, all of the, the different theories and, and scientific knowledge and helping to bridge that. Um, but in an integrated way that is um, not just breaking down um, different disciplines into their uh, different component areas, but actually an integrative way of looking at um, what is going on in, in uh, the environmental crisis, I suppose, um, and, and looking at that in an integrated way. Um, so I'm not going to go into what Earth System Science is, because clearly I don't think I need to in this um, particular uh, forum. Uh, I know there's a combination of philosophers and, and scientists, and I believe that everyone has a pretty strong understanding of um, Earth system science um, as an, an, uh, an integrative way of looking at all the spheres of, of the Earth, how they in, uh, how they all work together. And um, you know, particularly after um, the, the 1999 Vostok um, um, ice core was published. And, we got this really strong understanding then of, of um, Earth as, as an organism um, that you know has very specific limits, you know, striking sort of upper and lower bounds um, of atmospheric you know, um, constraints that it 
operates within. And um, that data was, I think, really important in characterising um, the system as a whole. Um, and so one of the interesting things now that is um, sort of emerging um, is very much the um, idea of that we're in the, the, uh, this new epoch of the Anthropocene. And the reason why this is, is so important for what I'm proposing in line with me today is because I, I believe that for you know, pretty much the first time in, in history, we are really having to pull together new scientific um, understandings and in this um, very profound era where um, that there is certainly a lot of change and really grappling with some very big decisions about um, and very big questions um, about what it means to be human on Earth and the, the sorts of um, the kinds of societies that we want to um, forge you know, for the future. And ultimately, um, you know, putting putting the the Earth system science in the, in, in the Anthropocene together is um, thinking about um, the way that we live in this integrated system that we humans have dynamically engaged uh, or are still in the process of, of, of that engagement. Um, and so given the complexity of, um, of this um, sort of overall characterization of where we're at, it seems to me that there isn't currently a really strong framework for um, starting these kinds of conversations. And like I said, coming from a bioethics background um, and an environment, environmental ethics background, I personally didn't find that either of those um, disciplines was adequate or sufficient for the kind of conversations that we need to be having. Um, and so um, uh, just a, a couple more of the, the reasons why I'm Proposing um, this new discipline, and there's many of them. But in terms of, you know, I, I have a short time today. But you know, one of the, the big areas is around, you know, paradigm shifts in science, and um, you know, having this widespread information that something is wrong, but then trying to bridge that into um, what it actually means for us moving forward in the next 50, 100 years. Say, um, how are we going to actually adapt our institutions, our societies to live in a way that's um, compatible with physical, the physical realities. Um, and so um, Aslo, as Laszlo states, you know, the breakdown of an established paradigm is not necessarily recognised by everyone um, in the scientific community and unlike the refinement of an established paradigm, the transition to a new paradigm is not a cumulative process of adding, adding data to data and construct to construct, but rather it's um, taking, it's the entire foundation upon which the old paradigm um, rests, which is called into question. And arguably this is uh, characteristic of what's happening um, at the moment. And so for a new paradigm to be accepted, it needs to explain all observations of the previous one and propose something um, in addition. Um, and upon acceptance of the new paradigm, all the observations of science are reassessed. So this is very sort of large and sort of big picture uh, thinking, but um, I think that in terms of um, where we're at today, the challenge now is recognizing that this paradigm shift is, is occurring and what are we actually going into. Um, and you know, one of, one of the examples, I mean, again, I, I don't need to sort of stress it um, with this audience, but um, new understandings about, um, you know, co-evolutionary processes rather than um, 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 in, sorry, I'll, I'll go back a little, um, neo-Darwinism and, and systems perspectives on evolution, which are um, lending, you know, shedding new light on co-evolutionary processes. Um, of, of evolution, and this has a really significant um, meaning for, um, for, for life in human uh, societies today. Um, because it, in terms of a, a um, um, it's a, you know, from a systems perspective, uh, essentially stating that you know, um, evolution involves a, a generally sort of 
irreversible trend towards a um, structural complexity. Um, and it's really changing the way that, um, that we understand, um, that, that we're understanding, um, the, the, I guess, the Western myth of, of control that's rooted in a very mechanical cosmology. Um, so cosmological um, viewpoints are certainly um, very important and, 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 and changing in terms of these sort of paradigm, um, paradigm shifts. Um, another area that, um, one of the reasons why I think a new discipline in terms of the framing and the language that we're using, um, at the moment, you know, uh, the language that we have is, is, um, is insufficient um, and language as it works is, you know, obviously you know, very vitally important because all of the frames that we used create mental constructs which um, shape the way that we see the world. Um, so if we can understand um, frames through language, all the words are defined um, relative to conceptual frames. So in this sense, um, we can understand language as, as a technology um, and we need new terms and new concept, concepts to give life to new meanings and ideas. Um, and this is sort of coming through with um, uh, philosophers and anthropologists like Bruno Latour, who's proposed um, uh, concepts such as earth boundedness, which completely sort of changed the way that we think about um, our, um, you know, what our, our relationship to nature. Um, so by using a new concept, you're not bringing in the old conceptual thinking of, um, of, of, of past words. Um, and so these kinds of intellectual concepts and frameworks um, need to be developed and refined and studied. Um, and to, to a larger extent, um, this I think is, is somewhat characteristic of um, a, a bit of a crisis of le the legitimacy across disciplines because when we come to talk about the environmental crisis, we don't necessarily have the language to discuss um, what is happening from this kind of systems perspective. Um, and we end up in speaking in very sort of general terms about you know, pollution and um, very sort of pinpoint issues that don't necessarily um, marry up to um, what the, the sort of physical reality of the system that we're operating within. Um, and the, the last point that I'll make on, um, on language um, is, is um, Professor Yuval Harari, who, um, who is also um, really influential um, in terms of his work on the history of um, history and use of language. He says that um, you know our our ability and our um, um, the, that made human society Homo sapiens flourish so much was our use of language and basically um, that you know this essential invention which we were able to imagine the order. Um, so he calls this imagined order, literally, um, to be able to invent our cultures. And so I think that in terms of where we are now, um, and such a, a huge sort of paradigm shift that is underway now, um, really needs these new concepts to, uh, to shed a lot of light on, um, um, on, on a lot of the, the, the sort of changing um, relationships that forward than I'm going to touch on. Um, I mean, just very quickly, but uh, I won't go into it too much, um, metaphors and, and um, understanding uh, the, the different metaphors that scientists have proposed and, and are working within um, and how they translate into um, the, the larger community, um, you know, which are largely at the moment based on mechanical view uh, and mechanical system um, understanding of Earth. So, um, at the moment, the, the predominant um, metaphor is, is carrying capacity model from the limits model, which um, is clearly better than no limits, um, but arguably it is also having, um, it's limited in it, its own right because it's essentially, um, um, you know, the idea is translating to Earth systems that if they can tolerate the pollution and damage, but only to a certain level, and then it becomes 
becomes you know, the task of scientists to define what these livable limits are, and even when it may be impossible to define them, um, because the thresholds really exist, and when they do, they're certainly very hard to define. Um, so that can obviously be, be very difficult for scientists calling their objectivity into question. Um, and, and I think this is one example of an area where um, closer collaboration between scientists and the humanities um, can, can be very beneficial. Um, and also where a transdisciplinary approach can really, can really assist. Um, so this concept of a, of a new discipline is inherently transdisciplinary because where we find ourselves um, is uh, at the moment different disciplines operating in isolation from one another and not being able to carry on having these kind of complex discussions that we need to be having. So in terms of the architecture um, that um, I'm proposing, so um, as an integrate, integrated field of inquiry, um, it's based on a new conceptual organisation. Um, and it's really um, to provide the, the intellectual framework to attempt to the task of thinking, designing, and articulating um, a new paradigm. So, um, like I said, bioethics um, arose um, largely around um, because of the new biotechnologies uh, from a, a medical ethics that just didn't allow for the kind of conversations and the sort of um, you know, articulation of the problems. We woke up one day and we had Dolly the sheep, and we really didn't know how to discuss and think about some of the big ethical and social dilemmas and questions that that arose in our minds. Um, and so bioethics developed in this way that was largely um, situational to begin with before they realised that actually having a foundational ethics was a really important uh, aspect of continuing to, to do the science. Um, so I'll quickly skip to the, um, to the actual principles because this is sort of the, the meat and where I'd really like to get all of your feedback. And um, I've started with um, uh, 10 principles and one that universally applies to them all and broken them into three separate subcategories of cosmology, views of nature and social ethics. Um, the one principle that is an outlier that can be applied um, universally is synergistics. And um, this one is, is really important because it involves the interaction of multiple elements of a system to produce an effect that's different from and generally greater than the sum of the individual. Um, so in relation to, to commerce, synergistics describes the state of affairs where people, groups or companies work together in creative and innovative ways um, to, to, produce, um, to produce something. And it, it calls for the establishment of a, a human earth relationship that's mutually enhancing. Um, and um, essentially, a synergistics vision of a world is a vision where ecosystems, social and economic systems are self-pollinating, um, renewing and in a constant cycle of growth. Um, is, that, is that two minutes? You've been speaking for 18 minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, the next one under the, the, the subcategory um, of, of cosmology is planetism. At the moment, um, you know, that's one of my ideal principle. Um, I'm speaking with Professor Bryce Clark um, about the possibility of using his term planetary immunity, which is really around the idea of, um, of, um, of Gaia theory, um, put into a, a more solid uh, sort of principle. But planetism is really a concept of planetary nationalism, where our first allegiance is to planet, um, just as a, as a worldview, a way of um, thinking above, like a nationalistic sort of um, way of thinking. Um, interdependence, which is fairly you know, sort of straightforward in, in terms of um, what that means. Um, and interestingly, Leonardo da Vinci, through his body of work over his lifetime, really um, you know, put, uh, really had um, interdependence as a core thing that ran through a lot of his work. Um, ecological enmeshment, um, which is uh, a principle from Timothy Norton, whose um, uh, work in dark ecology is uh, telling us about um, new ways of seeing um, ourselves as, as intimately a part of and not separated from nature, the realisation of agency, which is largely in relation, um, of, um, in opposition to the principle of respect for 
nature, which comes through from environmental ethics, um, but the realisation of agency is really um, telling us that we are the ones that can deliberately mess things up. Um, even though there is no separation between nature and ourselves, we have the agency to be able to change things. Um, uh, obviously, proportionary principle, I'm, I'm sort of out of time, so I'm going to have to really rush through, but um, proportionary principle is, is definitely one that's um, a, it's a little bit difficult, it has fallen out of favour, but I think it's a really important one in terms of you know, looking forward and um, um, the, again, you know, some of the decisions that will need to be made without necessarily having 100% science in front of us. Um, Solidarity, so getting into the social ethics, um, the last four of solidarity, cooperation, subsidiarity, and efficiency, um, which are largely self explanatory, but um, um, perhaps you know, in questions um, I can explain a little bit more about those. Um, so, I guess, you know, in closing, just really quickly, so I know I'm over, but um, overall, the, the theme of is a renewed dialogue between the scientific community and in particular system scientists um, and the humanities um, as it's you know, a really important time at the moment in particular to, to, um, to really uh, generate the sort of depth of discussion um, around um, ways of advancing science in a way that is um, we are able to communicate <coughs>
connected back to um, you know, a systems view of um, you know, the system science. So if we're taking a principle like subsidiarity, for example, having decisions made at a local level rather than having to go all the way up, up to the top. So um, more empowering the local communities to be able to um, you know, make more decisions. Um, and so I'm, I'm sort of, um, I'm mindful that it, it might seem a little bit, um, it's sort of quite conceptual at the moment. Um, and so that's, it's sort of difficult to, to start out the conversation with people that aren't necessarily sort of, um, um, I guess, you know, with, in, in sort of where, where I'm at with the, in terms of all, all the contextual stuff. But I guess the other point to make is that if we don't have this, we have situational ethics. And so we get to the point in 50 or 60 years time or 70 years time, hopefully not sooner, when you know, geoengineering is like really happening. And then we're in situ and we say, well, actually, I'm not so comfortable with this. Um, but where is, our, where is a common framework to begin a conversation around whether we want that or not? Um, and, and this is where I'm saying that I, I don't believe that bioethics is a suitable um, framework to have that discussion um, because it's a different discipline that's, that's started from, from its, own, um, you know, its own sort of reality. And I don't necessarily think that the other kind of um, ethical normative um, constructs we've got at the moment are necessarily sufficient. They're definitely helpful and useful. This is not about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, but it is about having a common framework. Um, so I'm sorry, it's probably, I'm not sure if that really answered your question. Yeah. Um, yeah, my question actually continues on just where you left off at the end here. Yeah. So, so I wondered, what are the challenges for an ethical framework for what you say? So you started off by saying, well, for century 50, we taking on the world apart, it's now time to put them together again. And you sort of suggested that the moral theories we have currently would not be fit to cope with such a situation. And so there's really two questions here. I think of the first would be um, why not? So if you take utilitarian ethics or Kantian ethics or Aristotelian ethics, so you, you make your list. Um, I would definitely so it would be good if you could indicate at least briefly what's wrong with, for instance, you, on utilitarianism, which is the most common ethical framework. Right. I, I'm not um, ruling where out do we go any from of there? those. So? I'm not ruling out any okay. of those. Um, a principles approach is really um, identifying principles that everybody can recognise. Um, and so it therefore becomes a, a, a framework that is very inclusive, it's recognisable. Um, and it sort of sets the limits for, for discussion. It's like the parameters around. Um, if, if, it, if it did become you know, a discipline and you have your earth system ethicists, um, by all means I would expect that they would use all of these um, utilitarianism, and they would, they would be using these approaches, um, and rightly so, but within this framework. So I mean, that's how bioethics works. You know, it's got the, the core, pillars um, of, of the biomedical uh, principles and then within that it's, um, it, it's added to with, with all of the other ethical uh, theories that, that exist. Um, so I certainly, I mean, there's no reason to rule them out. Go um, just under a minute. saying something about the sort of attitude that one wants to uh, adopt right. in, as an individual or as a discipline yeah. might be useful. Okay, I might 
might talk to you after, because I'm not sure that I completely understand. It would be good to elaborate. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.